Alzheimer's prevention. Alzheimer's prevention. Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's. How do you say it? We've had this discussion this morning. We're trying to keep it on 30 minutes. Uh, it's dementia prevention, right? So the first off, let's talk about dementia and Alzheimer's. They are. Okay. Dementia is cognitive impairment as we age. Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. So Alzheimer's happens to be the most prevalent form, the most common form. Uh, there are causes that we know about. There are causes that we ignore, and there are causes that we proliferate through our wonderful medical system. And we're going to talk about that. But it's not normal. It's not normal. Or like, it, okay, it's it's common. It's not normal. Right. So let's talk. I think people think, oh, well, that's just what happens when you get older. Right. So what's the statistic like? I have some statistics, and by the way, everything will be in the blog post below this video if you're watching it on my website, but it'll be available to you. So, so um, currently, according to the WHO, around 50 million people worldwide suffer from dementia. I think it's higher than that. I think and it says 10 million new cases per year. I would bet you that that's actually in the U.S., not worldwide. Okay. Even though I'm the one who found the statistic, and let's be honest, the World Health Organization is as criminal and as crooked as they come. Uh, but that it's where we have statistics. That's where I got that statistic from. So, it says it is expected to soar 100 to 152 million by 2050. So, so that's triple right in 25 years. Yeah. Which I buy. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to take less time than that. So one in every 14 people over the age of 65 are affected by Alzheimer's. And it doubles every five years after 65, the risk goes up. So statistically, one out of three people by the time they hit 65 years old is going to have some sort of chronic disease that's going to impair their quality of their life. So by the time you are hit quote unquote retirement age, you're supposed to enjoy your life. You can feel not good. One out of three of this is not gonna feel good. Right. That's I don't wanna be that person. So. So normal, common, common, not normal. Yeah, yeah. You don't you don't have to age that way. Yeah. I think it's important we talk about the preface here though. Okay. And I want to make sure we I drive this home tonight when we actually do the class. Uh, the, the number one, the before you do any of these eight steps, the first thing you have to do is to turn off the TV. I also call it the stupid box. Hey. And the reason why I think this is so important is because of this thing, there's a, there's a principle I want to introduce tonight, and it's called, um, it's called limbic capitalism. Okay? Limbic is referring to the limbic system of your brain, which is like your hyper, whenever you feel strong emotions, it's coming from the limbic system of your brain. Okay? It's what makes, when you're angry, you're in a limbic state. When you're super angry, when you're super horny, you're in a limbic state. When you're super hungry, you're in a limbic state. All this is coming from the limbic system. So limbic capitalism is literally people and companies making money off of you when you're in that limbic state. Okay, so you're watching the news. Okay, first off, the news is bought and paid for by the pharmaceutical companies. We know the pharmaceutical companies are paying for the research. That's where the, the term sponsored science come from. They're paying for the research. They own the data. They manipulate the data. And they've been, not sued, but they've actually been criminally punished multiple times for manipulating that data, giving it to the public as false data. And we accept it as gospel truth and make drugs off of it that are going to make our lives infinitely better. But guess what the number one three killer in the United States is? Medical mistakes. You cringed. No, like it's you knew, bad. You knew that was coming. Right. Hey, so the whole idea of limbic capitalism is everything you see on TV, they're trying to put you in a limbic state so you buy the crap. Hey, example, the news. What's the news going to do? Put you in a state of fear. So you're all of a sudden, you're scared of what's going on overseas, and what do they hit you with? Oh, do you have this symptom and that symptom? You need this drug. Hey, my favorite, sports. How many times do I get pissed watching sports? All the time. All the time. I'm yelling at the TV. I'm bouncing up and down. And what do they hit you with? An enlarged picture of a Taco Bell taco 
that you can get for free if they steal a base and all the like they really zoom in so you can see like the texture and the which but shouldn't really it's, tempt anyone right but it's getting that limbic <laughs> you're getting that dopamine limbic response that is limbic capitalism at its finest so if you want to live a long happy healthy life you got to turn that tv off because they're just going to keep hitting you with that stuff or learn how to know the difference just educate yourself. Just educate yourself so that when those commercials come on, you're wise to what they're trying to do. See behind the lines. Yeah, see behind the lines. So that's limbic capitalism. So number one, turn off your TVs. Okay. I think the, th the other principle that I want to introduce tonight is the whole concept of marginal gains. And marginal gains are basically when you make small changes in your lifestyle now, you won't notice them right away. But give it six months, give it a year, give it a decade, you'll see huge changes by making these small things now. Perfect example is going to the gym. The first time you come to the gym, you walk out of there all swole, muscle tone, looking awesome. No, it takes years because of marginal gain. So keep that in mind as you're making these choices uh, and these changes. And it's the same on the flip side, I think. I mean, look in our own house, right, of an active teenager who can eat, quote, whatever they want and not see anything see it goes the flip side too you might not see positive gains you don't necessarily see your negative what you're doing no. either right 15 years losses. 15 years later you're like oh i guess i shouldn't have built my tissue out of mcdonald's because now it's all great right because as we <laughs> age we're more we are more susceptible to inflammation and all right. the other stuff so you know people come in to me and are like i'm just getting older well no you're getting older but you're crazy inflamed right that's not healthy it's not just age, and I think that's the that's the thing I saw in practice. Is it's not just age. Right. It's not right. just people that get old. There's you can be old and be healthy. Right. So seven minutes in, all right. We've lost people's attention, so let's hit them with the with the eight things. Okay. Okay. So number one is going to be to lose weight. Right. Number two is going to be to eliminate sugar. Number three is going to be moderate caffeine, alcohol. <laughs> And weed is the way I originally wanted to title that thing, but right. I, I'm specifically re, uh, recreational drugs. Number four is, is getting rid of refined grains. Number five is ditching the industrial oils. Number six is balancing your hormones. Seven is something I call RMS, which we'll get into, which is read, meditate, and, and sleep. And then number eight is, um, is to get as much muscle as you can. So we're gonna, those are the eight things we're gonna dive into those. In For a little, prevention. For prevention. A, and I made a joke when I announced this class that I wrote on the whiteboard. If you can't remember the day, it's probably too late. I'm sorry, but there's times that it's too late. We talk about one of your patients all the time. What can we do for her? But it's really, she's at that point that she's at that point of no return. Right. Like that's marginal losses that have been gone beyond something that you could do something about. Right. So we don't want to get there. So here's how. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is education. Yeah. Like, so every patient that I see, in a rehab setting is not being taught anything Zero. about safeguarding their brain at all. In fact, in that, in, we'll, we'll bleed this right over into, into to number one, or number actually we'll bleed into number two, which will eliminate sugar. But in the, even in that rehab setting, in the hospital setting, when you have these events, what's the, what's the cafeteria full of? The foods that cause us in the first place and the foods that are gonna stop rehab from happening wow. at all. So, but hey, you know, insurance, Medicare pays for it. Yeah, and, and it just nobody's told. And, and nobody's told. I, that, I think that's what breaks my heart, right? Like, I can very well see myself on that other side of just being a patient that, you know, has something happen to them, and who do they trust? They do trust their doctor, right. and the doctors mean well, but the medical system is not as it should be totally broken and so nobody is told i get patient after patient nobody's told hey okay early onset of dementia that's a patient that i have right early onset of dementia like 60 years old going downhill fast no one's telling her you know eliminate sugar say goodbye to refined grains moderate your caffeine like that's not being talked about it's simply well get some therapy and therapy is helpful. Anytime you get therapy, it's helpful, but it's there's so much more to the picture. So I just I, I guess I have like that compassion for the patient because 
they're wanting to do what's best and they think they're following the instructions. And they are, the instructions just are missing a lot of important things. And so I think that's hard. Deb, why don't you hit it with Okay, uh, so weight? number one, lose weight. Um, this should be a no-brainer, but it's not. Well, I feel like no-brainer, but I genuinely, like thinking like about people, I genuinely don't think people understand that weight has anything to do with the brain. Right. I, I see right. people thinking brain is like a different entity in your body. That's 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 a thought process we need to stop. Right. We've got to start. We've got to stop like compartmentalizing our sicknesses and start looking at the body as a whole because right. you really cannot affect the kidneys without affecting everything else. You can't affect the gut without affecting everything else. Right. You can't affect the musculoskeletal system by and. But I think people think gain weight just means. I will be overweight, right. period. And they think the answer is? Lose weight. Just need to reduce her calories. Right, but it's, it's simply like, well, I'm okay being a little bit heavier. Not like, whoa, you're being heavier means <laughs> brain health is going down. Like, I just don't think that's, I don't think it's known. Right. I genuinely don't think people know. So here's the deal, hey, there are studies that have shown that your the size of your gut is inversely proportional to your brain which basically means the more gut mass you have, the less brain mass you have, because your brain's just not functioning, functioning the way that it should. So we know that belly fat and stress are directly related. Um, high amounts of cortisol equals high amount of belly, body, of belly fat, period. And cortisol is over long periods of time. Hot time um, is detrimental to brain health, and it actually shrink the matter inside of your brain, so you literally come up with a smaller brain. Uh, the other point, important thing with this I want to make is when we say lose weight we mean you've got to do it the right way they the medical ways that are out there are a surgery to shrink or bypass your stomach or what's popular right now is all the Ozempic Wagovi stuff right at the end of the day both of those mechanisms are 100% there just to reduce calories well, you can reduce calories all you want, but if you're not getting the proper nutrition, you're not going to feed your brain. And guess what? Your brain consumes 20% of whatever you put in your mouth. 20%. That's a huge number. So you're going to neglect your brain if you're just restricting calories. We gotta look at whole foods. We gotta look at high nutrient, nutrient dense foods in order to do this if you wanna lose weight the correct way. Uh, the other point that I'm gonna make with this, and we'll move on to number two, is there are studies that have shown that people who go through these bariatric surgeries have a higher incidence of dementia and Alzheimer's than those who don't. And I think over time we're going to see the same thing with Ozempic, semaglutide, Wagovi, what are all those, you know, the GLP-1 uh, medications. We're going to see that. It's just a matter of time. They're new. They're new. Okay. So, number two. Eliminate sugar. Eliminate Sugar. Again, to us, this is a no-brainer. Uh, but there are people that, uh, you know, a little bit of sugar is, they think it's okay. In fact, there was a time in our medical system that we thought a little bit of sugar was actually good for you. But we're now we're learning the exact opposite. If you look at um, uh, Ben Bickman's book, for example, he talks about Alzheimer's and sugar and quotes a lot of the modern research that's actually ca calling Alzheimer's uh, type 3 diabetes, which is a you know, an insulin dysregulation in the brain leading to uh, Alzheimer's type symptoms. But the reality is, is like your brain thrives better on ketones than it does on sugar. So ketones are the byproduct of your body burning fat instead of sugar. So you've heard of all ketones or ketosis, uh, ketogenic diets, that's what I was looking for. Uh, people do really well on that their brains actually improve when they do those types of diets. Uh, we're trying hard to introduce something here that can help you stay in that state yeah. and make it sustainable. Um, but the whole process, the whole thought process, and I go back to one of my chiropractic school classes, um, even back in 2000, that's probably 2004, they were teaching that glucose, your brain needs glucose. And I remember the teacher was a bodybuilder, and he, funny dude, um, he, he was in the middle of lecture telling us this stuff and he's just like, and he was in a cutting phase. So he's having zero sugar and talking about how he just needs a freaking M&M. 
you know, because his brain needs it. Well, actually, it doesn't. It needs ketones. So this ties back into your experience in a clinical setting of doing rehab for the elderly and for people with brain issues. What are they feeding? I know they're, wake, they're waking up with juice and cinnamon rolls, and they're eating juice and cinnamon rolls before they go to bed for a bedtime snack. And but this is what I think is interesting. I just had this thought: was I think when children are young, we'll make the joke. Everybody knows. Nobody does anything about it, but everybody knows. Oh, don't give the kids sugar; they're going to be hyper. Okay, well, where does hyperactivity stem from, right. right? It's fueled by the brain. The brain is creating this behavior issue and we'll accept it in a small child. I had a kiddo show up yesterday for speech therapy and the mom was laughing because he was bouncing off the walls and she's mm -hmm. like, gave him a cupcake when he left school today. And he was literally, right. and, and we all accept it. We all recognize that as, oh, this is the product of eating sugar. But it's like, we don't take that a step right. further to say, hmm, I wonder what's happening in my own brain. I'm an adult now and it's not gonna maybe make me hyper because I have the wherewithal to control myself. Right. Right. But like, it's doing something to my brain. Right. In a child, we see it acting and, out this way. And in an elderly, it's fueling, like you already have dementia, you just had a stroke. Right. Like we need brain healing food right. and the and, rehab, menu had no brain healing. Well, if the rehab menu promotes what got them there in the first place, which is feeding, you know, 60, 70, 80 years of addiction. You know, because heaven forbid, we can't just take a pill and we actually have to change our lifestyle to prevent that from happening in the first place. Well, it goes back to the economics part of this. Drug company doesn't make any money if you don't have to take those drugs. So uh, that's number three, that's sugar. So number three, um, Caffeine, alcohol, and weed. Caffeine, alcohol, and weed. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. I'm going to refer people to Dr. Daniel Amon's work and his studies. Um, he's done functional MRI, more functional MRIs than any other human on the planet. And he is convinced that blood flow is disrupted in the brain with excessive ca alcohol, excessive caffeine, and he thinks any marijuana and any amount of weed is going to decrease the blood flow to the brain. Now I know we're going to get a little backlash from that and fine, whatever. Right. And people are going to say, well, moderation, moderation. It's kind of hard to argue with Dr. Amon. Right. The research is solid. Uh, the re his research is pretty solid on those things are all going to decrease blood flow to the brain. And lo and behold, the second leading cause of dementia is vascular dementia. Where's which it coming from? <laughs> which is blood flow, which is disrupted by sugar, inflammatory oils, which we're, we're going to get to, but a lot by alcohol, caffeine, the weed. Oh, leads right into grains. Right into this is a this is a great one, right? Because uh, number four is refined grains. Uh, here in our area, we get a lot of uh, religious backlash, backlash from this because there's a belief that you know wheat is for man. Uh, which I don't disagree with, uh, but the problem is, is you know, starting in the early 1900s, man started manipulating and modifying wheat into what we have today. We don't have a genetically modified wheat source; we have a hybridized wheat source. Uh, but we spray all sorts of junk on these grains, and that, and that junk is getting into us, it's specifically glyphosate, uh, which is Roundup, which was you know Monsanto, the company Monsanto. Uh, by the way, Monsanto also brought us Agent Orange, which we were totally, you know, told that it was perfectly safe. And I don't know how many of the veterans I've come across that it was, it was a bad, bad deal for them. Uh, anyway, grains, refined grains, they're going to be full of glyphosate. They're going to be genetically, some of them are genetically modified. We're seeing that on cereal boxes now. Um, Wheat in particular, highly hybridized. A lot of people reacting to it. They're completely unaware they're reacting to it because they just want their sandwich and they can't live without their sandwich. Uh, but the reality is, is those things are going to cause disruptions in gut function de and decrease in blood flow to the brain, which just make this whole perpetual cycle worse and worse. Majority of wheat intolerance, we could step it further into gluten, all of the things aren't digestive. And right. I think that's why people don't well, think that they have an issue. And, and you have a personal story here, because when I first met you, you thought your fatigue and your headaches were just because you were a single mom working two jobs. 
and what happened when you came right. off of these foods? Right, two weeks and no headaches, increased energy, and right. yeah. So, it, and it's other people I talk to, right? It's it's brain fog, it's irritability, it's you know all sorts of things that I think we have to be really aware of ourselves to recognize it. But I mean, you look at celiac disease, and it's a low incidence that it's digestive. But I think that's what everybody's go to, like, oh, that doesn't bother me. That doesn't give me a stomach ache. Right. And it's like it, it's not. And so if you if you think about it, if you looked at celiac disease, right, and all the neurological symptoms that we now know, okay, so let's think about that. What is this food doing to anyone? Maybe if you even don't have celiac, they're still proven. Right. Um, and <laughs> bad for the brain. 100%. And I also, I've seen over the years, uh, people that will come in and say, well, I tried to go gluten free. Well, what they actually did was that they took their standard American diet and, made it and swapped out the breads, pastas, bagels with gluten free breads, pastas and bagels and had similar reactions to that stuff. But they blamed the gluten when in reality, they're still eating processed junk. They're still getting the same results. Still eating grain. So this is, they're still eating grain. And that's why we're a big proponent of, hey, you know, our diet program, our weight loss program, is based off of eating whole natural foods and eliminating these food, like these grains, and that's why people start to feel so good. So um, that was number four, so that was say goodbye to refined grains. Number five, industrial oils. So any oil with the exception, uh, it's easier to talk about the exception, right? If you come to our house right now, the only oils we have in our house are coconut oil, avocado oil, and uh, extra virgin olive oil. EVO, yeah, extra virgin olive oil. That's it. Everything else was refined or sucked out of and chemically altered from a seed. So yeah, the most popular one is quote unquote vegetable oil. Soy, it, 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 it comes from soy. It's high in inflammatory omega-6s. Um, Again, the whole glyphosate issue is a big issue here because not only are you going to get inflammation, but you're also going to get glyphosate, gut disruption. They're rancid. Rancid, abnormal <laughs> brain chemistry, which I can make a pretty strong argument for a culture today and all the wacky, strange, uh, you know, it's like just yesterday, a, a American Airlines flight, or I'm sorry, Alaska Airlines flight had a off-duty pilot in the cockpit that jumped up between the pilots and tried to shut the engines of the plane down. Why in the world would, would a sane person do that? So my take on that was, I wonder what his omega-6 to omega-3 profile looks like. Do you think the other people think like him? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I wonder uh, what his brain chemistry And this is why we're goony, right? And it's like you see, why we're nerds. you see these weird occurrences, you see these violent, violent people, and they have done studies that show that the omega-6 to omega um, three ratios in violent criminals are way higher than you know the standard. You know, ten to one is getting dangerous. These guys are like sixty to one, seventy to one um, from consuming refined oils. And where is the most common source of refined oils? Fast food. I was gonna say, I'd say fast food. Yes, <laughs> you know, McDonald's, Pizza Hut, any any Subway. Anytime you're eating out. Yeah, anytime you're eating out, you're subjecting yourself to these oils. And it's in, it's in the processed food you buy too. I mean, there is canola oil right. and flour tortillas that you buy off the shelf. Right. Uh, the, the grilled chicken breast chunks that we have bought on occasion. Oh, at Costco. At Costco, one of the ingredients, it's way down the list, is canola oil. I know, and I'm like, do so they grill it in this? Do they put it in it? I don't know. Must we, only buy those, we only buy those on occasion, and we still will eat a French fry from our favorite farm to table restaurant on occasion but it's not every day, three times a day, like a lot of people do. Moderation, so, you gotta have a little balance. And here's the thing about that too. We could do a whole story, whole thing about balance. Moderation, you do have to have moderation. If you're 50 pounds overweight, you cannot have moderation. Right. <laughs> you gotta be a hard nose until... Right, you're a little back anyway, Sorry, that's, that's a... You're, you're going off on a tangent. Yeah, let's, go to, let's go to number six, which is balance your hormones. We gotta, number six is balance your hormones. Um, everything starts with cholesterol. Hey, hormones are all made out of cholesterol. You have survival hormones and you have life is good hormones. 
um, your brain will take every ounce of cholesterol that you have, or your body will take every ounce of cholesterol that you have to maintain and to keep the stress hormones active because it can, thinks it can live with everything else. Uh, you can live without sex, but you cannot live without cortisol. And basically what happens is you suck up all that cholesterol, you don't leave anything else left for nerve production, you got a problem. You got a big problem. Uh, so when I see people who are happy about their cholesterol being in the 150s, I'm scared for them. Like you have to eat fat, you have to eat good fat, you have to eat cholesterol, but we've demonized it because we can sell a drug off of it. Uh, but the reality is if you want to protect your brain, protect your hormones. And if you want to protect your hormones, that's going to lead us into number eight, which maybe we should have changed the direction of this. Uh, protecting your hormones involves skeletal muscle, having a lot of it, having tone. Uh, but it's also looking at things like electromagnetic radiation, uh, men's testosterone dropping and cell phone use increasing are very, very much related because we keep our phones right here in our pockets. Uh, so there's a relation there. Uh, fragrances. They are everywhere. They're in our perfumes. They're in our deodorants. They're in our candles. They're laundry detergent. Laundry detergent. They're all known to disrupt our endocrine system and mess up our hormones, which will mess up our brain. So there's a lot you need to do looking into starting to make some changes. And what I would recommend as a place to start is just deodorant. Okay. You know, you're putting aluminum and fragrance in your armpit every day. In, Highly absorbable into the location. most absorbable skin on your body, minus your mouth, and you're doing it every day. So start looking into the natural, what's, what's the brand we've been using, Native? Yeah. Uh, there are much more natural deodorants that are out there. Uh, maybe it's time to start normalizing a little bit of pit sweat. Like we just think that's this like gross, horrific thing, but the reality is, is no. Blocking your <laughs> body's ability to sweat with fragrances and aluminum and dying of Alzheimer's, that's a horrible thing. Right. There's a relation there. But I think too, I know we have a couple more to talk about still, but all these things are pretty, are like foundational. I think a lot of people, when you talk about bringing up, it's like, okay, what supplements do I need to do? And what crazy, like, you know, we even, our show, right? Biohacking, right. wellness, right. right? They want all the hacks, right? I'm gonna cold plunge, I'm gonna do this. It's right. like, if you don't have the basics down of simply having a healthy weight, and making sure that your diet consists of whole foods and that like, right. you don't need to worry about whether or not it's, you're cold plunging and taking a handful of supplements. It's, right? it's marginal gains, right. right? Cold plunging is awesome. I'll never tell anybody to not cold plunge. No, but if you're eating junk every day and not following these protocols and you're cold plunging, the only thing you do is you're freezing your ass off once a day. Right. That's it. Right. So it's like you got, this is like the foundation. This is like the building blocks. You do these things, then you right. can add all those fabulous things. And yes, you're going to be the person that's, you know, the 75 year old that's doing the backflips off the cliff we see when we go boating, right? Like that, that can happen for you. But it's probably not going to happen if the only thing you're changing is adding in some crazy things. I, I brought that up with him when I ran into the grocery store. Oh. I, like, I saw a video of you doing a backflip off of a boat. I was like, really? <laughs> that's cool. He's like in his 70s. All right, it's number seven, RMS. Okay. Um, RMS number one is read. Uh, Not on your phone. We have a library. When I say read, buy paper books. They cannot be canceled if they're on your shelf. <laughs> we have a whole library of stuff that we've read. And we have on our Amazon store, there's books in there that are our favorites. But that's where you're going to get into this information. Right? Because they'll, people will publish a book like John Abrams, his book, Sickening. I freaking love it that points out all the corruption that comes from the medical system. Like, Google has the power to stuff that down into its searches so you'll never find it, but if it's on your bookshelf, they can't touch it. Uh, the truth about COVID vaccine, the, uh, what's the one, uh, the, Anthony, oh, the truth about Anthony Fauci, it was John F. Kennedy, or Robert F. Kennedy's book. I had to stop reading it because it made me so mad, but it's on the shelf and no one can ever take that away from me. So, and reading. you can just read other books too. You can, and I do. <laughs> I, we do read for fun. Right. Um, I love, you know. The whole I'm just thinking of the light issue right. too, right? right? And like maybe not having your phone always with you. So. Right, your phone's giving off ultra or um, intense light that's affecting your brain chemistry. So reading your book right before bed calms you down, lowers your cortisol. The just the the moving your eyes is brain exercises. You're cognitively thinking about 
you know, other thing, right. you've got to read. Like, you've just got to turn your phone off and pick up a good book and get addicted to books. You will live longer if you do that. Um, meditate. Um, tons and tons of research about meditation. It doesn't need to be big and fancy. It doesn't have There's, to be, like, long either. It's right. You're just having a few minutes of reducing your stress. Yep. That's the key. Breathing exercises. Uh, prayer. Like, it all fits into this meditation realm. But it's literally the act, the, 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 the act of sitting in stillness. Like right now, if I pause for 30 seconds and just focus on my breath, I'm meditating. It doesn't need to be hard. It doesn't need to be hours, hours a day. You can go as simple as looking up, you know, five minute meditations on YouTube. You can be as complex as, you know, Dr. Joe Dispenza and getting into his stuff where you can literally like change your world um, from the inside out, which is fascinating, fascinating stuff. And then lastly on this on the RMS is sleep, um, seven to eight hours a day. If you want to live long, in about seven hours, your brain starts to detox itself, starts to clean itself out. Um, you need to prioritize that. And muscle. Like, you, if you're going to the gym right. every day but not sleeping, you, you, you cannot build skeletal muscle the same way um, if you don't sleep. And, like, sleep deprivation undoes things really fast. So that puts us right into number eight, which we'll wrap it up with. And we're not going to make we have We've gone we over our 30 minutes, time. but not by much. All right. And we'll wrap this up. Um, your brain needs fuel from the food and it needs activation. Activation comes from reading, from, but mostly it's going to come from movement. It's going to come from muscle. Your muscles have receptors in them that are directly connected to your nervous system that tell your body, body how long and how strong that muscle is. So literally, the more muscle you have, the more input you have going to your brain, the longer you'll keep it alive, period. So people in the weight loss program, when they first come, I say number one priority, let's get X amount of pounds off of you. Second priority, get shredded, get muscle. Uh, muscle is literally the organ of longevity. The more you have to a point, the longer you will. And like if you're taking testosterone or if you're taking, excuse me, steroids to get all this muscle, because you think you're, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a balance. There's a point of diminishing returns there, but. Uh, you need muscle. You need muscle, you have to have muscle. You know, if you, you think about. Think about the 70 year olds that you know, and the ones that are vibrant, how much muscle do they have versus the ones that are deaf warned over, how much muscle do they have? Right. It is a direct correlation, so. And this is a cool thought I listened to, I heard this the other day. It's the only organ, skeletal muscle is an organ. Right. And it's the only organ you can manipulate. Like you have the power to manipulate it. Like you can't manipulate technically like your heart. You're not gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna grow my heart or I'm gonna grow my, you know, shrink it. Like your muscle, you have total control over. Like you can change it. And it, if you grow your muscles, you you will grow your brain. Right. There you go. That's it, there's eight of them. Okay, so the thing that I love about this, I just wanna wrap up with is Alzheimer's, dementia, all of these things, yes, they are common, they are prevalent, the numbers show it. Nobody really talks prevention. It's the same thing when it comes to cancer. The only thing prevention we hear about is getting screened for it, right? right? Nobody's telling you, what can I do as a person? Like, what can I go on today mm -hmm. or to help my parent, right? Like, I'm at the age where I have parents that are entering this realm, right? I had, my grandfather had Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, so, as far as I know, nobody ever taught, it was just like, oh, no, no. he now has Alzheimer's, so guess what? He's going to eventually die. It, we're going to have to put him in a nursing home and he's not gonna be able to remember anything. Like there was no talk of, there's actually stuff you can do. You can slow the rate at which your brain deteriorates. Some pretty simple things that for, to me, that should be a lot of hope for people. Right. Like it should be like, wow, like my parent is aging, but I can help them. And it can simply be by, I'm gonna teach them what foods they need to eat. I'm gonna like be sure I take my elderly parent on a walk and we're gonna get some little light, lightweight dumbbells. Right. And like, nobody talks about that. Well, no. And it's not evident in rehab settings either. So they're not getting it from a medical professional either. And there's the other side of that is not only can you help them, but you can help you. Right. And when you help you, what does that do for the next generation? You right. help them. Right. right. So it starts here, like, if we're gonna prevent it, like, thinking people that maybe already are on that slope, but like, I'm gonna build muscle now, I'm eating well now, so that my brain has a fighting chance. Not against my genetics. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>